Es ist uns eine große Ehre und gleichzeitig ein großes Vergnügen, diese Reihe hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums präsentieren zu dürfen. Denn es ist weit mehr als nur diese Veranstaltung heute Abend. Wir zeigen tatsächlich zwölf Filme seines Schaffens. Insgesamt hat er an 97 Filmen mitgewirkt. Das muss man sich mal vorstellen. Und ähm, ja, ich lese Ihnen ganz kurz mal vor, welche Filme Sie in diesem Monat erwarten. Und das ist äh, besonders zu verdanken der peter ustinov stiftung die diese Veranstaltung als Kooperationspartner wundervoll unterstützt hat. Äh, nur deswegen konnten wir all diese Filme auftreiben. Das war nämlich sehr, sehr schwierig zum Teil. Und die sind weit verstreut durch ganz Europa. Ja, ähm, das erwarten uns folgende Filme. Es ist Topkapi natürlich, den, sehen, äh, den hat man schon am Dienstag gesehen. Am Samstag gibt es eine zweite Chance dafür. Lola Montes von Max Offels, Peter Ursinov als grandioser Zirkusdirektor, sollte man sehen. Billy Butt, Die Verdammten der Meere, äh, Regie, Peter Ustinov und Kapitän Weir, Peter Ustinov. Auch das ist sehr, sehr sehenswert. Eine weitere Regiearbeit, Vice Versa. Nicht mal Igor hat ihn gesehen bisher. Also das ist wirklich eine Rarität. Ähm, dann geht es weiter mit Bo Brummel, äh, Rebell und Verführer. Da spielt er den Prince of Wales an, an der Seite von Stuart Granger. Ganz, ganz hervorragend und faszinierend. 1954, also noch vor dem Film, den wir heute Abend sehen. Ja, als nächstes Quo Vadis, ganz klar, der darf nicht fehlen. Der Nero, den er uns da auf die Leinwand geworfen hat, der hat Geschichte geschrieben. Den zeigen wir auch gleich zweimal natürlich und dann auch nochmal zum Abschluss der Reihe. Er hat auch Science Fiction gemacht, das mag man ihm vielleicht gar nicht zutrauen, retrospektiv. Ähm, Logan's Run aus dem Jahr 1976, deutscher Titel Flucht ins 23. Jahrhundert. Da ist keiner älter als, äh, als 30 Jahre, nur er ist der einzige alte und weise Mensch auf der Welt und er rettet dann auch die Menschheit. Also sowas hat er auch gespielt. Death on the Nile, Tod auf dem Nil, seine Paraderolle, der Hercule Poirot, ganz klar, den gibt es hier auch zu sehen. Der zweite Oscar, Spartacus, war sein erster Oscar eigentlich, den zeigen wir hier auch auf Leinwand und der auch in einer ganz tollen Fassung, nämlich der ist digital restauriert worden von Universal und den haben wir hier auch bekommen. Und ja, an seinem Todestag, dem 28. März, ein ganz besonderes Programm. Kinder lagen ihm am Herzen und es ist uns eine große Freude, einen ganz besonderen Kinderfilm zu zeigen, Robin Hood von Disney, den er selbst synchronisiert hat, in mehreren Sprachfassungen natürlich. Und auf Englisch gleich zwei Rollen da quasi gesprochen hat. Und dann ein wirkliches Highlight, seine allererste Regiearbeit, School for Secrets aus dem Jahr 1946. Noch Mitte 20 war er da und da hat er seine Kriegs, äh, ja, Kriegserfahrungen verarbeitet. Und das ist wirklich sehr, sehr sehenswert, denn da blitzt dieses Können von ihm auch schon durch. Das ist eine sehr, sehr seltene Kopie auch, die wir vom British Film Institute bekommen haben. Das nur als großer Querschnitt zunächst mal, was uns hier im Monat März erwarten wird. Wir sind hier, um Sir Peter Ustinov zu ehren und er war äh, zeitlebens immer wieder äh, schon, also sein, sein Können wurde immer wieder schon wahrgenommen. 1956 gab es eine Kritik über ihn äh, im Darmstädter Echo, habe ich es gefunden. Da stand ein Wunderkind unserer Zeit. Also selbst 1956 bereits, ein Jahr nachdem dieser Film, den wir jetzt heute sehen werden, gedreht worden ist, ist dieses Urteil quasi über ihn schon gefällt worden. Und das war durchaus zu Recht. Mit 17 begann er seine Schauspielkarriere bereits. Mit 24 verkaufte er sein erstes Drehbuch. Ein Jahr später war er zum ersten Mal Regisseur und mit 30 zum ersten Mal für den Oscar nominiert. Später ging das nur so weiter. Es gibt wunderbare Überschriften und Anekdoten, die man finden kann. Peter Ustinov kann alles und macht alles, zum Beispiel, ist dann da zu lesen. Und das ist wirklich so, wenn man quasi einen Beruf für ihn finden möchte. Ähm, da gibt, kann man hier unzählige Sachen aufzählen. Ich versuche es mal. Buchautor, Erzähler bei Hörspielproduktionen, Musikclown, Dramatiker, Cartoonist und beim Film Synchronsprecher, Schauspieler und Regisseur. All das war Peter Ustinov und zugleich ein Weltbürger des Witzes und vielleicht der erste richtige Europäer. Das hat er nämlich 1951 im Spiegel schon gesagt, dass er sich als solcher fühlt. Ähm, das ist auch nachvollziehbar, wenn man seine Familiengeschichte kennt. 
ähm, als Sohn einer Französin mit italienischen und äthiopischen Wurzeln. Der Vater war russisch, russisch mit deutscher Staatsangehörigkeit und geboren in Großbritannien, getauft in Schwäbisch Gmünd. Kann man, kann man mehr Europäer sein? Ich weiß es nicht. Ja, die, die Komödie war keineswegs das einzige Feld, auf dem sich Peter Ustinov betätigte, aber heute werden wir durch eine ganz wunderbare Komödie auch zu sehen bekommen. Und zwar auch in einer ganz, ganz tollen Fassung. Wir werden hier einen Film zu sehen kriegen, We Are No Angels im Original. Das ist eine Kopie, die ist jetzt 59 Jahre alt. Und zwar nicht nur der Film, sondern tatsächlich auch das Material, die 35 mm, die wir hier heute einlegen. Das hat äh, zur Folge, dass wir tatsächlich in das Vergnügen kommen, Original Technicolor zu sehen. Die Cineasten werden das vielleicht äh, ein, zu schätzen wissen. Das sind ganz brillante Farben, die damals schon wirklich alle Kritiken so begeistert haben, dass das immer auch erwähnt wurde. Ähm, im gleichen Atemzug muss man natürlich sagen, 60 Jahre fast. Da sind ein paar Schrammen drin, ein paar Kratzer, bitten das zu entschuldigen. Also es wird ab und zu auch mal einen Ton- oder Bildsprung geben. Das ist aber nur in wenigen Szenen. Wir sind sehr, sehr froh, dass wir diese Kopie hier haben und freuen uns sehr, das heute mit Ihnen gemeinsam zu feiern. Bevor ich gleich Igor Ustinov auf der Bühne begrüßen werde und wir ein Gespräch führen, möchte ich zunächst noch Marie Korbell von der Ustinov Stiftung nach vorne bitten. Vielen Dank, dass wir das möglich gemacht haben. Sehr geehrte Gäste, liebe Freunde, auch im Namen der Sir Peter Utzenhoff Stiftung möchte ich Sie herzlich willkommen heißen. Heute ehren wir Sir Peter Utzenhoff. Vor zehn Jahren ist er vor uns gegangen und vor 15 Jahren hat er mit seinem Sohn Igor Utzenhoff die Stiftung gegründet. Wir wissen, dass er nicht nur Schauspieler war. Herr Uspüri hat uns schon ausgezählt, was er alles gemacht hat. Und ich kann euch allen viel Spaß wünschen. Und vielleicht sehen wir uns jeden Tag im Kino heute. Ab heute. Ja, vielen Dank. Ja, und dann begrüßen Sie mit mir Igor Ustinov hier bei uns. Herzlich willkommen. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's Thank really you. great. Thank you. Um, it's such a wonderful family. And to see you, you're looking so much like him. And, and when we hear, I heard you singing before, and uh, you're an artist uh, like him. And all the, all the, your family, you, you said uh, in an interview, there are so many artists in your family. Um, why didn't you become an actor uh, uh, like him? Well, because uh, probably when I when I went to school, I I was um, I wanted to know what is real. Mm -hmm. This is when I finished school, so I said to myself, I'll study biology, because biology is the real material of life. You cannot cheat with biology; it's the way it is. And sculpture fascinated me because it's the real material of the world, the material world. And so I was inclined to look into that because it's not something today that one usually does because it's difficult. I rapidly realized that I didn't have the temperament to be a scientist because <laughs> scientists have to be very humble. They have to wait for the results. <laughs> Artists have the privilege of creating the results so they don't mind You know, they do what they want, and I feel free because I'm an artist. Could your father have been a scientist? I don't think so, no. Why? <laughs> because he produces results, too. And scientists have to be um, very humble, like uh, priests, or uh, you have to worship nature and wait for suddenly some knowledge and some truth coming out of, of the research and this is a very difficult thing i have a big admiration for scientists although not so much uh, admiration of what science is doing to the world i think it's much more dangerous than art um, 
I was asking because I, I have read a, a very biological comparison of him uh, to be an actor. He said, uh, being an actor is like flying like a bee. Um, you get honey from everywhere, but you're coming home hungry in the evening. <laughs> that's what he said. And uh, oh, That's interesting. I didn't know that. that <laughs> but... <laughs> But uh, I really like that, uh, what he's saying, because that means um, that he was much more into it when he was also a writer and a director. Perhaps. Well, it could mean also that that uh, when you're performing, you're not really yourself. Mm. You're hiding the behind role. whoever you're awesome. impersonating. And when you come home, you're, you're alone with yourself. Uh, maybe because you perform too much, isn't it? To speak about uh, science, there's a law in science that if you uh, radiate, you do not receive. And being an actor, you're always radiating, you're performing, you're sending out things. And so you're not receiving. And so the communication with another person is is through different ways. I mean... Sometimes you can be extremely generous through your art and not know how to communicate to a simple, normal thing, you know. So I I did uh, realize that there was a great loneliness in being a performer. Is uh, that the reason that he did so many films? Because uh, I read it's 97 movies where he was a was an actor, and uh, only in in 1955 when We Are No Angels was shot, um, he he shot three movies, and uh, that's uh, enormous stuff uh, if you're doing Hollywood films. Yes, but um, I think my father was basically an artist, a creative artist. He was firstly a writer, and film was part of his uh, his, his ways of, um, of surviving, of communicating, of relating to the world. But I remember as a child when I would go on to the stage, no, in his in his, where he was waiting, because when you're shooting a film, most people don't realize that you have to wait for hours for the light to be properly installed to especially in the old days i guess when when there were set designs and things like that everything had to be prepared by ev all the different professions before you suddenly arrived and did it so uh, my mm, maybe other actors were really worried or or puzzled or thinking about what they should do during the scene that they were expected to do at some time when they're told. I, I saw my father go back to his, um, to his um, room and, and go on writing a play or writing a book or, send, or doing an article or uh, preparing some other thing that he's doing. So I was really impressed in, this, in the way that he wasn't just an actor, he was, he was a creative um, artist the same way I'm do I'm doing my sculpture uh, alone thinking of what I want to do yeah. so he was really a multifaceted person and he could at the same time be a performer write a book and he could lock and change from one to the other and in incredible uh, speed mm. so I always saw him as a as a intellectual athlete which is um My rare people ha have this uh, ambition, even. Yeah, um, you were talking about loneliness in in uh, that job, and um, that's interesting because he, I would say, he was a genius in being a co-star. Uh, uh, he was at the beginning uh, not the main star in all the films. He was the guy who made the other guy made even uh, shine even even. Gl more glorious and and bright yeah and and he was so intense even being a co-star um, but for that you had to be a team and not not the loner uh, that uh, no i was not referring to loneliness by being alone i was referring of when you 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 have end up coming home and being alone mm. with who you are because if you're just a uh, just a person living with other people and you don't have this 
you know i always I always think of artists there the, the you know like you take a classroom let's refer to school in uh, 90% of the children if they get a good grade they're happy an artist if you give them a good grade he says oh what should i what more should i do and he worries about creating and things so so it's a different kind of person and an artistic person is always alone recreating the world and this is the way they are so i think my father was definitely one of those and um and then he was a, a great entertainer yes absolutely i mean he was always trying to make life easier for the people around even when he was very sick at the end he was this was a very dramatic moment he was always making a little sound or something to make it a fun moment mm. <laughs> i mean it sometimes it really contrasts with the with you know we we're, we're all forced into a situation but he would make it funny or happy and i must say this it's a great talent to make a life easier for the people around you and i think if people should try and think that it's a good idea to try and do that mm. do you remember when you first recognized your father is such a great actor which film was it well uh, as a child i i uh, my father was always traveling and and we were with my sisters we were always uh, you know a bit a bit left in the back with uh, you know because in china they say bigger the front of the medal bigger the back mm. we were in the back and we saw i saw my father you know as I was taken out of boarding school to see uh, UNICEF galas, for instance, and we were sitting in the first first row. And says, "Whoa, how lucky these th children are to have such a great uh, father, you know, that's concerned about all these children." And then we would t be taken back to school. Not that we were poor children; it was just that reality was strange, mm -hmm. and. What I can say for other children of actors, we have a privilege that most uh, children or most people didn't experience. We can see who our parents were before we were born. Mm -hmm. So when I see a film of my father in the 60s or, or in the early 60s when I was about three, four years old, mm -hmm. Buttocks, I'm, for example, yeah. I'm really surprised mm -hmm. to see he, the way he was. The same was my mother, who was a... F beautiful film actress mm -hmm. she was the um, Desdemona in uh, Othello's film I see her like that and I say wow what a beautiful woman mm -hmm. what I remember of her is go and brush your teeth go to bed <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that that's a real gift yes because most people they remember their mothers only yeah. uh, go to bed and brush your teeth <laughs> <laughs> and being old And being old, yes, of course. And we will see uh, him in all his ages uh, in yeah, this month, a, for example. It's, it's uh, I think today with video and with with personal photography and the way everything developed, this privilege is is more and more shared by everybody. But at my generation, I was very happy, very lucky to have this um, this privilege to see my parents. Uh, who they were before we came and spoiled everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, did uh, many, many other actors visit you at home? Well, I, I remember when we was quite young, we were living in, um, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And Los Angeles was like, you know, the center of cinema. And we had the Gregory Peck. I still, I'm still friends with the son of Gregory Peck. Um, there was uh, the Michael Douglas. You know, all these, these, these were my uh, my play play people when I was very young. <laughs> Then we moved out, and I remember during um, um, Spartacus, I went to school in Italy because we would follow my father everywhere. So. Uh, I would start the, my schooling year in Los Angeles, 
then do the middle of the year in New York, and then finish in in Italy. So it was very uh, strange. Um, when I was about the age of nine, I had I went to twenty different schools bef before the age of nine. After I only did two. <laughs> so. You can't say that it's a normal, uh, normal family life. It's, it was very intense and special. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you something about. Um, perhaps I, I, that's important. He he was uh, in the Second World War. Uh, he was mm -hmm. a private soldier, and uh, he went to the. Uh, he was in the propaganda section, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, his, his he met there some some very uh, popular filmmakers afterwards. Uh, his lieutenant was David Niven, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, was also together with Carol Reed, who did The Third Man, for example, and they directed documentaries and all that. Would you say that uh, this era of the Second World War is a very young man Has has made something of him. Uh, has made him the way he he became afterwards. Or oh, I'm sure it had an influence. But uh, <clears throat> my grandmother, Peter's mother Nadia, she was a set designer for Covent Garden and also <laughs> did the sets of several uh, plays in London. And so she was living in the surroundings of uh, of theatre. And my father wrote his first play when he was 17. And uh, one day there was a friend of the family, a famous critic, I don't remember his name, who, said, who came to dinner. And my uh, grandmother said, look, my son wrote this play. Have a look and tell me what you think of it. And the critic liked it so much that the play was taken on into, I think it was played in Soho and was very successful. So this was even before the war. So I think his choice to become a performance uh, actor and thing was 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 natural, nearly. But of course, to be put into the propaganda, uh, if I remember, my my grandfather was part of MI5. He was in the, in the English Secret Service. First, he was a German diplomat, and then changed <laughs> and uh, uh, I think my father was supposed to join the secret service too but they d they thought he was uh, you could spot him too easily in a, in a crowd <laughs> so they decided that that wasn't the right thing for him <laughs> maybe today it's the best way to hide is to be very yeah, uh, right. obvious yeah. but <laughs> so um, he he was put into the um, to to the army and he Naturally, um, they managed to uh, to learn his skills. Um, he had all sorts of problems with the army, so I think they put him in the propaganda just to, to you know to, to keep him busy. I heard that they were doing a, um, a simulation of attacking a village. And there were two teams, you know, the way they do in the army. And one team was protecting the other team, preventing them to to get to the center of the village. And my father thought the whole thing was quite stupid. So he, um, this was all in the evening. He went to the first uh, house and rang the bell. And the people said, what is it? He says, Sorry, could I go through your house and through the garden? He says, yes, why? This is military, uh, you know, military training. Oh, yes, of course, please. And he crossed the thing, and then he crossed the road again, and he crossed the next house, and in about 20 minutes he was in the middle of the village, and he made the, the chief of the other uh, team prisoner. <laughs> and of course the, the the chief didn't want to be a prisoner he said this is not fair you can't do this it's much too quick we started this game <laughs> a half an hour ago this should absolutely I refuse so what my father did he started speaking German and screaming to him 
And so he was arrested. He said, how come you speak German? And this this is the kind of problems they, he had in the army. So he was taken to a special place where they were asking him how come he could speak German and why did he speak German, first of all. He said, well, what do you expect the, the enemy to be speaking? And so he was always, you know, he hated the army. That's fascinating that you uh, that you say that because uh, the Financial Times wrote to this 80th birthday, um, even if he even if he is joking a lot about the German, he himself is more German than English. No, that's probably uh, it's very interesting because if you look at the the way he related to Germany and uh, the success he had here and uh, was it more. Than in England? Well, at the end of his life, yes. It slowly went from England. You could see that a certain of his books were first published in German, even though they were mm, yeah, written right. in English. Mm -hmm. And today the foundation's in Germany, and, um, and I regret that I didn't have the same exposure and I can't speak German, but I really like also German culture uh, when... Uh, When I used to uh, go to um, uh, Düsseldorf for the foundation, the Vorstand was um, Clemens Grosche, a very wonderful man who did a lot for the foundation. He would say to me, Igor, where do we, where do we go and eat? And I would say, how about some real German food, a suckling pig or <laughs> some Nürburger sausages? And he said, oh yes, I have the right place. And eventually the He had stomach cancer, and I was worried that uh, I maybe felt a bit guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, being that multilingual um, was a big opportunity for your father in, in uh, being an actor also. Because if you're thinking of Lola Montes, for example, um, uh, shot by Max Offels, um, that was uh, in three languages. Um, mm. They sh shot three uh, options for, for the international market. Mm -hmm. uh, in one in English, one in French, and one in German. And uh, he was the only actor of the main actors who was able to do them without any uh, difficulty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially Carol Martin. If you will see the the movie here, we have the German version here. Um, She permanently looks over uh, Ustinov's sh shoulder when they were shooting a scene together because behind him uh, there was a big poster with a, with a uh, phonetic transcription and mm. she, she couldn't say it uh, fluently yeah. normally. Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. And so he had a, a very special gift for being in the international market, not only in the British or American. Well, his mother, uh, Nadia, was of French origin that... A fr French family who moved to Russia but kept on speaking French was in the family. And uh, her father was, um, he had a German passport. He was in the German Luftwaffe during the First World War and as a pilot. And, um, and my father was German until the age of nine. And of course, English, he went to school in England and, and, and that's probably the language he was the You know, really, he's a writer in English. He really, his English is absolutely beautiful. Mm -mm. So it's all the family exposure to all these these <clears throat> languages. I, I read that he went to Europe and, and to Italy and France for shooting because he didn't want to be that kind of stereotype. Because at, at first he was in the monumental movies, he was at Spartacus, he was at Quo Vadis, and uh, he was or, or, uh, he was in, like, We Are No Angels, uh, a criminal or a mm -hmm. prisoner, and he wanted to do something else. And so he began to, uh, to write for his own movies, and, and he went to the European uh, director's to have something completely different would you yeah, say that's possible well it's i my my um, perception of it is that uh, i know when he finished when the war finished and england was in a very difficult uh, situation he was also under a lot of pressure and he had personal for personal reasons and he went to los angeles in a contract to make a few mil a few movies But one shouldn't forget at that time there were still the McCarthyism. Mm. Uh, if you were European, if you had a Russian name, 
if you even uh, were, were friends with Charlie Chaplin or things, you were highly suspect. I saw interviews of my father by those, you know, sort of people who, who controlled, made sure you're not a communist or you're not. And he was so clever to tease them without, you know, this, it was wonderful to see the way he sort of got away with it. But at some point, I mean, in those days, uh, people with a free, free, free mind, you know, like Charlie Chaplin had to leave and go to live in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And I think my father followed him also for that reason, because it was difficult as a European, with a European um, culture, to fall in that uh, American, uh, you know, really primary Oh, are you, are you a communist? You know, that kind of thing. You think of other people? Hmm. Explain yourself. You know, that kind. Of, and that was that, the, that was the period. Mm -hmm. And he did do it in the Nero style, I think, all these things. Or <laughs> when yeah, the funny story I heard about Nero, my father was on, uh, he owned a, an old sailing boat, from 1929 that was always uh, you know fixed in a very we strange way and he was in uh, <coughs> in uh, Greece on an island and he re received a telegram from um, uh, I think it was MGM mm -hmm. who told him oh um, sorry you don't have the role because um, you're too young and he did He didn't lose his uh, punch. He sent a telegram back. If you wait another few months, I'll be too old because uh, Neron died at the age of 33. <laughs> And then they, he received another uh, end, uh, telegram from the Americans saying, It, it's proven that you're right. We're waiting for you for the role <laughs> on this date. So careers are so, um, you know, Is a, you have to have an opportunistic side to you. If not, you, you'll just sit on the boat and say, oh, I lost the role, you know. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that he not only wrote film history, he wrote history completely mm -hmm. new because for people today, and especially kids, um, that's the only way to see Nero. Yeah, For, for all of us, I think uh, we say Peter Ossinoff, is Nero yeah and mm -hmm. he was burning Rome and mm -hmm. uh, we had two weeks ago a, a famous German uh, cabaretist I don't know the English word uh, um, comedian kind of Gerhard Polt and he was uh, telling the same thing and he was even saying it in his new movie uh, so so it's something that that people really yeah seems to be important to mm -hmm. say okay we need to have history in the movies and there are very very few people and characters like the Nero of your father That mm -hmm. have such an impression But obviously the this story shows that he had the, the education, the culture to know exactly mm -hmm. or he took the time to find out who Nero was he, which mm -hmm. is a very important thing I mean you can't just say I'll play a historical role and, and uh, make your normal face and you have to really understand the the madness of the man and in, in in the case of nero and that is um you have to have a, a wide range to understand madness <laughs> without being mad of course <laughs> Mm, I, I have to say I have a very personal, yeah, uh, I, I think very personal of, of Peter Ossinoff because one of my favorite movies as a child was Robin Hood and I watched it and watched it again and again mm -hmm. and uh, once I realized, okay, uh, this great Prince John, this is Peter Ustinov and then, uh, okay, I said my, my father's favorite movie was We Are No Angels mm -hmm. and uh, he was there also and so the, that's, this is very interesting because I, I always love this kind of humor and um and you said you, your favorite movie is billy Bat, and uh, this is something completely different without uh, any humor I would yes say. Uh, as a grown-up mm -hmm. billy Bat is my favorite mu movie as a child it's probably uh, blackbeard's ghost mm -hmm. especially that uh, blackbeard's ghost is a moment when 
my father, the ghost, tells the children, you should uh, win by any way. Doesn't matter whatever you do, but just win, win, win. There's no morality at all. <laughs> and I found it, I found it wonderful as a child because when I was doing uh, things that the professors uh, would, uh, you know, be wanting to punish me, um, I had the perfect uh, answer for my father. You, you, you told me that I should do just <laughs> anything, but just win. <laughs> What was his answer? <laughs> Well, he, uh, once he was uh, um, called by the director and he said, oh, I have a problem, your son is, is making fun and, and, and uh, the whole class is, is always laughing and nobody's working and the results are dropping and we don't know what to do about it. And my father said, well, you know, I make my living like that. How, what can I tell him? <laughs> It's a true story. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, old, the the headmaster was a German, uh, no, a, a Swiss colonel uh, of the army, and he didn't find this situation funny at all. <laughs> If he could have punished my father, he would have done it too. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Butt is a story about uh, punishment, about a mutiny on a on a sail ship in the 18th century, and uh, it's completely different because uh, yeah he plays the captain on this boat mm -hmm. and he has to suffer a lot to get at the end some kind of democracy and for that you have to suffer so it's very philosophical and the interesting thing is it's uh, the first movie where he wrote the script uh, had the, uh, was the director and was one of the actors mm -hmm. and uh, and he was also the producer yeah and, and uh, i remember that uh, period because even though I was very young, because he was doing this also with my mother, who was taking a bit the production side to it. And it was very difficult because it was a sort of uh, arty film. It was in black and white. It was done with people who were very devoted to the film. I think they ran, uh, ran out of money during the film and they had to take it over again. It was really... Uh, But the the aesthetics of this film, it's so sober and so, um, as you say, it's it's philosophical, but it's it's also disturbing because this is a man who has to choose in between compromise, or being uh, um, promoting order, or or um, being just. He has to choose in between being human or inhuman. I mean, it, 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 there's no solution. You have to see the film. Mm. And the way um, it, the, the images, the acting is really top. You know, it, it has none of this sort of... I think in those days also, um, you, you, didn't need, you didn't need special effects or... It's it's beautiful. It's like a play in a way. Mm. That's what I like about it. Also, it's kind of it, like you go into the soul of. It's it's completely different, but it's also kind of the same thing we will see tonight. Uh, it's um, being human or being inhuman. They are angels in a way, yes, and we yes. are no angels. And it's also a stage script, uh, on, mm. uh, and. Yeah, the only thing of a visual effect is the glory all, the Heiligen shine that you will mm. see at the end of the movie. And mm -hmm. um, what do you remember? How do you remember this movie? Um, what kind of angel did your father play here? No, I remember. Uh, yes, that it's, it's the same same kind of topic, but uh, the gravity of the situation is very different. But. Um, And it's, 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 I think Billy Budd is, is much more, it's, it's, uh, it's a more complex dish mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to take in, yeah. But it's a beautiful, uh, I mean, I understand your father was, it was his favorite. Um, I was older when I saw this uh, film last time, and uh, my father was, younger than I remember, so the whole thing was a bit mm -hmm. strange. A bit, a bit yeah. strange. And I must say, uh, 
It is strange to see um, one's father uh, in a film. I guess other people see it, him differently. Because if I see him as Hercule Poirot, for instance, mm -hmm. I look at him saying, oh, he's dressed up. You know, because he's too familiar to me. Or if I see him as a caliph with a, with a turban, it doesn't work for me. I just see my father with a turban. <laughs> <laughs> because he's too, he's too close, you know. So so it's difficult to really have the the um, the eye of the spectator, you know. And that's different in a movie when you you were not born yet, as like. It's no? it's more surprising because I, I see I see him before um, before my memories, and also maybe when I when I look at him, I'm I've went through these ages, and I have a way to compare oh he was like that at my age <laughs> you see mm. it's interesting mm. before we are now screening the movie and we have a wonderful print uh, here tonight i want to read uh, a critic out of 1955 that is very very special and if you know already the film um it's a yeah it's a very comical movie it's a very yeah uh, It's it's not not very not not uh, not not angry not yeah you will see it but I will read out uh, the Evangelische Filmbeobachter of <laughs> uh, so <laughs> from 1955 and just the end of it but it's amazing I will switch into German if no, no, I understand your permission. Das ist barer Unsinn und ein echt amerikanischer Klamauk schlimmster Sorte. Das allein wäre noch hinzunehmen. Aber die Art, wie hier die früheren Verbrechen der drei, darunter auch drei Morde und die, weiter, die beiden weiteren Morde, die sie in diesem Haus aus purer Nächstenliebe begehen, als gute Witze und gar noch als ein gutes Werk hingestellt werden, ist eine geradezu gotteslästerliche Frivolität. Der Film ist umso mehr zu verurteilen, als er mit groben, aber leider recht publikumswirksamen Gags und Pointen arbeitet, die den meisten Zuschauern, besonders natürlich Halbwüchsigen, zunächst gar nicht bewusst werden. Ähm, bewusst werden lassen, dass sie, dass sie hiermit selbst schon verbrecherischer Leichtfertigkeit die Grenze jenseits der Witzblasphemie ist, weit überschritten wird. Selbst einer Groteske ist nicht erlaubt, in derartiger Weise mit Menschenleben wie mit Karten oder Würfeln zu spielen, ganz zu schweigen davon, dass nebenbei auch Gebet und Gottesdienst lächerlich gemacht werden. Die Rückkehr ins Gefängnis ist ja auch in keiner Weise Anerkennung einer Schuld, sondern ein ebenso guter Witz wie alles andere auch. All, äh, das Fazit Alberne amerikanische Groteske, die in so verbrecherischer Art frivol und zynisch darum gefährlich ist, dass sie auf das Schärfste abgelehnt werden muss. Yeah. That was 60 years ago. <laughs> Do you want to say us something before to hold it against that? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> There's nothing to be added. <laughs> <laughs> but It we will, speaks of itself. Yeah. But we will add something afterwards. Then you have the, the possibility to ask questions after the movie. Now we have uh, some minutes uh, to, to uh, rebuild here the, the stage and uh, to get into it. The, the film cafe has still opened, uh, so you have the possibility to get another drink before the movie starts and then, uh, yeah, have a nice screening. It was a great pleasure to have you well, here. Igor, uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you for, for for putting all this together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome again Igor Ustinov here with us. This was very nice. Yeah, I think so. Did you enjoy the screen? I did, I did. It's, it's really... Great uh, pleasure. And uh, of course, the first question is, how did you have Christmas at the Ustinovs? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> as Without I told you, we're, we're, no, as I told you, we're, we're, um wasn't a big tradition in the family. Uh, once I phoned my father and I said, Merry Christmas. And he said, how conventional you are. <laughs> and I said, oh, it was just in case you were. That's about <laughs> that's Christmas. <laughs> But uh, we don't want to talk on our own. So you have the possibility to ask questions to Igor if you like to. And we have another microphone because we are filming it also. And uh, just give me a sign and then the mic will come to you. And 
friends, don't be shy. <laughs> I especially like the idea of Adolf, and you never see it as a, a snake uh, called Adolf. Ten years after, after the Second World War, is is great, really great. Oh, I see. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, you can see here what I what I said before. Uh, he is a co-star, and Humphrey Bogart is has never been so funny like in this movie, I would say. And that's because of Peter Ustinov. Yeah, because probably his, his uh, spirit and what they were doing off stage, you know, was was so much fun that it changed the character of the others, I'm sure. And another thing that I, I saw, I, uh, a journalist asked my father when he was in the hospital, Uh, what would you like on your um, on your grave, which is a horrible thing to ask somebody that's not in good shape? And he said, "Don't step on the grass." And and this you see in this film, he says it several times, which is for me interesting because maybe there's a relation between um, Adolf and <laughs> <laughs> and what happens afterwards. <laughs> He was not bitten, I hope. No, no. <laughs> well, please, uh, if you have uh, questions for Igor, ask them. It's a unique possibility here in Frankfurt, I think. Yeah, over there. Oh, no, yeah, first here. Yeah, first the question. I thought it was quite amazing that there was no music. Is this, was there no music or it was just this presentation? That's the original uh, w uh, version we have here, so I think there was no music in it, and uh, because perhaps it's a it's kind of a stage version. And Michael Curtis was the director. He also did, for example, Casablanca. Um, he, yeah, perhaps it was he completely his decision uh, to say, okay, it's the actors movie, and uh, they will well, yeah, keep it. <laughs> well, if you think of uh, of the, um, the film, it's a bit like a play. It all happens in one house, and when he comes here, it's like a vaudeville stage, in a way. Yeah. So if you add too much effects and things, you lose that, that sort of theater thing to it. Uh, that's what's really um, very efficient, that we're locked up in one house and think people come in and out. It's a bit like a stage thing. Yeah. Definitely. There was the next question over there. W was your father as um, humorous in your daily life as he was on stage? I mean, some, some, uh, somehow I thought must must have been terrible strenuous to live with somebody who is always hilarious and making puns and so so forth. Well, yes, when, I, when we, we got together, he was very funny all the time, yes. Uh, even serious things uh, were, were treated with a lot of I I'm <coughs> I met somebody who who had seen us as children in Topka when my father was doing Topka P. We were all up, uh, um, we were all in the Hilton Hotel in um, in Istanbul. As I said earlier, we were following uh, him everywhere, and um, this person said, "Oh, I saw you as a child. You were running with your sisters, and your father was running after you, saying." Please, please obey. Your mother is going to think I have no authority. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we had a funny life. It was nice. Are there any other questions? Or even comments on the film? Out? Yeah. Uh, just wait for the phone mic. Who was your father's best friend? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's difficult to, for me to say he had, he had a few friends, but I can't say which one was the best. Um, but I was surprised when, when you know, moments of when were moments were fun and easy. There were a lot of people, and when things uh, went less well, you know, at the, at the end, there was uh, there was a lot of people who were there, but. Uh, Close, close friends, I, ca I can't really tell. There was one uh, who was uh, Leon Davicho, who was uh, uh, in UNESCO, and he's the one who took 
who proposed to my father to become a UNICEF, um, a UNICEF ambassador. And I think in a certain way he pulled my father towards humanitarian things. So I think there was some kind of close relation there, at least. Did your father comment on changes in the movie industry? The way he experienced uh, movie making changed over time? Not really to me. I'm sure there's a lot of documents on his position about it. Um, he did speak about a different way of filming, you know, in the old, in that period it was like filming theater in a way. And um, even the way, you know, close-ups and things, you, you get much less close-ups than today. You see just really close to the, to the face and you see the catch expression and the editing is totally different, I think. But this is my, my observation. I, we, we never spoke about this. Perhaps we have an expert here with us, uh, and a great interviewer, Felicitas von Schönborn, has uh, made a, a whole book with him, and perhaps you want to say something to, to the question? Uh, I, I couldn't understand the question. Um, how the, the film industry changed, uh, well, how did he comment on that? Uh, this is difficult for me to answer, because I don't know of the beginning of the film industry. But if you want, I can say a few words about my book. So um, it was a very big adventure to make this book because uh, Sir Peter was sometimes there and sometimes he wasn't there. So I, I was living in Geneva and then we had appointments. And so uh, now and then I was betting with myself if I would ring on the door, if he would be there or not there. And then uh, the first time I... I interviewed him, it was quite embarrassing for me because <coughs> I was very well prepared and I had two recorders and then there was a photographer and then I start talking to him and then uh, after 10 minutes this machine didn't work anymore. So I asked the photographer to pick up the second machine and everything was very well prepared. And while I was sitting there, I was so embarrassed, I was counting, and I said, one, two, one, two. And then uh, Peter Ustinov said, can't you count until three? And then <laughs> <laughs> so the second machine came, and then I was talking, and this and that, and everything went f wonderful, and he was copying the Queen of England, and it was a lovely uh, atmosphere. And suddenly this machine didn't work anymore, so it was really awful. And then I sa uh, uh, for saying something, I said, I, oh, I have made so many interviews already. So he said, maybe too many. And then he went to get up his uh, his uh, the same uh, machine. He I asked him to have a machine, and so three machines didn't work. It was <laughs> incredible. So I said, it's a very silent place here. So he said, this is what Sony thinks also, and that's why it doesn't record. <laughs> <laughs> this was the beginning. And then I had a lovely, lovely uh, experiences and went on and on, and he was kind enough to continue. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you very much. Have you uh, any other questions here from the audience or comments? Yeah, over there. Uh, hello, uh, th these are very general questions. Uh, first, uh, where are your father making special differences between the work on stage for movies and for TVs? Um, the second question is more related to uh, what many actors have already felt like. Uh, did your father always regret to have refused a project and which? Uh, I have a very good example. For example, uh, uh, Frankenstein of James Wade was an uh, uh, everlasting regret for Bela Lugosi, who was refused that part instead of Karloff. So did your father have such experience, such regret in his career? Well, probably, but I, d I don't know about it. Uh, I think he was always going to his next project and um, very rightfully didn't turn around a lot. Um, to such an extent that when he was doing one thing, he was also doing another one. So 
I don't think he really uh, indulged in regrets. But maybe he does. I don't know. He never spoke to me any about his regrets. That was the first question bit, uh, of the difference between stage and and television and movies. Well, I'm I'm not an expert, but uh, of course there is a difference. Uh, um, the the distance with the with the public is totally different. Um, what did you, uh, what did he like more? Uh, did he talk about that? Well, I think uh, even at Oprah, uh, by the way. Uh, well, I think uh, basically he was a playwright. And uh, even though uh, he told me at some point that to write a play is very difficult, and um, if you look at his, his life, he stopped writing plays at a certain moment of his life because he was too complicated. And also the theater changed a lot. Uh, but um, I think he's a, he's a theater person, more than a, even more than a, than a cinema uh, actor. So then, this was the perfect combination. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You see, yeah. you see it. The, the expressions, um, the reactions, and we were speaking uh, of teamwork. He was very good with teamwork because of the theater. I think also. Mm. Cool. So I hope this answered. Uh, it's okay. And wait for the mic again, please. Hmm? Uh, I should have started with that one. Uh, um, did he have a favorite movie in which he, sh he, he shot? Except the movie he directed, of course. I don't know. I don't know. No. What I was very impressed by this film now, and I, I thought... Uh, that he was really the the major actor, so he was reacting and smiling, and, and then it went around. It was really, very, really very amazing. And there's something in this movie I thought was very impressive: uh, the dialogues, and there was such a perfection in it, which one rarely finds nowadays. Movie also well, that's true, much absolutely. better technique and so on, and mm. really very touching and beautiful. And thank you so much. Yes, it was uh, really nice to see beautiful. to see this film again. A and pleasure I, for us too. <laughs> and I regret that I won't be here for the rest of the, yeah. the festival, but um, yeah, I'll stay with regrets for next time. <laughs> yeah, and we hope you will all recommend that and will come back uh, to our cinema. And uh, yeah, before we say goodbye, I have a, a, a last uh, quotation from Peter Ustinov himself. I think that's the, the perfect ending. And it's from his one of his last books. It was called Endspurt. And uh, yeah, I will switch to German again. Trotzdem färben Morgendämmerung und Abenddämmerung den Himmel auf gleiche Weise. Die eine ist Verheißung, die andere ein Abschied. Aber bei nur flüchtigem Hinsehen sind beide kaum voneinander zu unterscheiden. I think this is Very nice. the right end for this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the music. Thank you very much. Einen guten Nachhauseweg und ja, bis bald wieder bei der Ostenefrei hier im Filmmuseum. Kommen Sie gut nach Hause.